Hey everybody, my name is Jay, and I'm a delivery guy. No, I don't work for Uber Eats or Skip the Dishes. The place I work for is an old school type delivery company. We service the entire town of Hollow's End, with pizza, beer, takeout food, cigarettes, just about everything else you can think of within reason. Cash only, no credit cards or debit cards. We don't use an app or take orders by text or email. The owner of Doc's delivery service is, you guessed it, named Doc. He's an obese, disheveled, white-haired curmudgeon who never really leaves his smoke-filled house and refuses to make any changes to his business plan, despite new advances in technology and rational common sense. Rather than communicating via sensible means, like text message, we have to wire up our cars with these absurd three-foot-tall antennas, and he calls us up on a portable radio to give us our assignments. Then at the end of the day, we each go to his ramshackle house to settle up with him and collect our fees. Along with our equipment never changing, our wages never do either. The rest of the crew seems to have just accepted that we'll forever get a measly $2 per delivery, regardless of the distance being driven, while Doc sits on his ass at home collecting some ungodly sum which grows larger by the year. So basically I work for tips, which means the customer is always right, and I'm always the asshole. The radio was blaring to life as I sat waiting in the parking lot outside Randy's rotisserie. We got a lot of calls this time of night to deliver for them, so it seemed like a good spot to hang out. Jay, what's your 20? The voice on the radio was barely identifiable as human. But I'd been through this enough times that I didn't need to actually hear the words he was saying anymore. It's more about his inflection. Primarily, how pissed off he sounded. Outside Randy's, what's up? You drive over to the West End to Mario's Pizza, grab an order. That was all the way on the other side of town, across the bridge. A good 20 minutes. And Mario had a 30 minute delivery guarantee. But you don't argue with Doc. Not unless you wanted to be picking up the shittiest calls imaginable for the next week as his sick form of revenge. Okay, I'm going. 10-4. Any orders for Frank, by the way? With that, the radio went dead. Shit. Not Frank. Anybody but Frank again. I really needed to start refusing to go there like everybody else. But I was more than a little scared of Doc. Last time I'd refused to take a call, he'd assigned me to empties duty for a week. Basically, that meant going to all the worst houses where the dickhead alcoholics living there paid for their beer with ungodly amounts of empty bottles and didn't tip a red dime. One building in particular had made me anxious to never disappoint Doc again. A four-story walk-up where the guy had paid for his 48 bottles of beer with nothing but empties. Took me 12 trips up and down the stairs, and by the end of it, I wanted to die and take the customer with me. My hands were gripping the steering wheel with white knuckled rage as I pulled out of my parking spot and drove through several stop signs, cutting off drivers until eventually arriving at Mario's Pizza in the West End. They had the distinction of being the only pizza place in town that made their pie using a potato crust. The pies were three times as heavy as normal pizzas, and I had trouble carrying the tall stack out of the shop. You got five minutes, the owner called after me. Better hurry. Thanks, Mario. I yelled sarcastically over my shoulder. I got in the old white Ford and put the keys in the ignition, hopeful for the sound of the engine reluctantly turning over as it struggled. After several attempts, it eventually started and belched a cloud of unhealthy looking black smoke as it backfired and I began to drive hastily towards Frank's house. He was easily 10 minutes away. I got there in four. Regardless, as I pulled up to the front of the house, I knew I was too late. The time had just barely run out, and Frank would be watching the clock very closely, as always. As I hustled up to the front door, he opened it wide, and I saw the massive, dark silhouette of him tapping his wrist. The interior of the house behind him was likewise pitch black. Not a single light on in the place. I suppose you could say that Frank was nocturnal or would be if he ever slept at all. His eyes reflected slightly golden, 
mirror-like as he stared back at me from the blackness of his abode. You're late, he said in his deep, rumbling voice. The smell from inside the house was terrible, like old rancid meat and dead bodies, of which there were probably both. I always felt like a scared little kid when I stood in his doorway looking up at the creature who called himself Frank. And I never, ever went inside, no matter how many times he asked. He grabbed the stack of pizzas out of my hand. Oh, come on, Frank. It's physically impossible for me to get here that fast. I was on the other side of frickin' town. Not my problem, he said, opening up the pizza box and taking out the pie. He folded it with one giant furry blue hand while holding a stack of ten boxes with the other. Then he stuffed half of it in his mouth like an oversized taco and began to chew. A few seconds later, he finished off the pizza in one more massive bite and licked his fingers. Frank, please, I can't afford to pay for all these pizzas again. They take them out of my salary. It's my whole day's work. He pulled out a five dollar bill. Here, I'll give you the tip at least. He passed it over to me, smeared orange with pizza grease, and then he began to close the door. I turned around and started stomping away angrily when I heard his voice call after me. Hey kid. Yeah? I'll tell you what. I'll give you the money for the pizzas. But you have to make a pickup for me. A very special delivery. What do you say, Jay? Frank. If this is what I think it is, there is no way in hell. Literally no way in. We tried, remember? That escalator was busted to shit. I can't get you demon blood. Not that. Something else. Payment has already been arranged. Delivery is the only problem. The Hunter's House. I was beginning to suspect this had been a setup from the start. Guy probably wasn't even hungry. Frank tore open another pizza box as he waited for my answer, but it was obviously going to be a yes from me. I couldn't afford all that pizza. That was way too much dough. After getting the address from Franklin, I made for the house across town. It was, of course, on the north side of the city where I had just been. My gas tank was already getting low and I had only filled it up that morning. It was going to be a very bad day unless I made some decent tips somewhere. Halfway to the address, I saw an old woman walking down the side of the road in her slippers and house coat. Cars whizzed past as she walked with frail little steps down the gravel shoulder. Concerned for her, I pulled over and got out, calling after her as I ran along the gravel shoulder trying to catch up. Despite her advanced age, she was really quick. I looked at the passing cars scornfully. The old woman at the side of the road looked almost exactly like my grandma, I thought to myself. Didn't any of these people have grandmothers? Weren't they worried for this poor old woman's safety? She clearly wasn't in her right mind. Uh, miss, are you okay? Are, are you lost? I yelled at her, running to catch up as cars sped past. She seemed not to hear me, or pretended not to. I ran in front of her and stopped, out of breath and panting. She didn't look the least bit tired or concerned, and as I took in her face, I recognized her immediately. Grandma? Oh, hi Jay, sweetie. How's your day going? What are you doing all the way out here? Where's your nurse? Her home care nurse was named Tammy, and she'd been visiting every day while I was at work, taking care of her since it was just the two of us. My parents had died in an accident many years prior. A drunk driver. A hit and run as well. They'd never caught the guy. Oh, her. It wasn't Tammy today, it was some other lady. Mean. Rude. Disrespectful to her elders. She told me I couldn't have my lunchtime bottle of wine. And I was tired of her bossing me around. So, when she went to the bathroom, I left. Figured that would teach her. You left? 
Grandma, you can't be out here like this. You're in your slippers and your robe, and it's freezing outside. Come on, hop in the car. I'll take you home. After the wine store, she said, her hands on her hips, unmoving. Sure, after the wine store. <sighs> Come on, we gotta grab something for Franklin first. I said, taking her by the hand and leading her to my still-running car. Oh, I love Franklin. How's he doing? Do you know Franklin? She nodded, laughing. I opened the passenger door for her, helping her sit down in the low seat. Of course, dear. I know everybody in town. I've lived here my whole life. Well, he's fine. He wants me to pick up something from the hunter for him. Food, probably. Some interdimensional delicacy, I'll bet. I got into the driver's seat and pulled the car back onto the road. Eh, so he's the same as always. Still tricking poor, dim-witted youngsters into doing his dirty work for him. Grandma! Oh, sorry, dear, but it's the truth. You really need to start standing up for yourself to that boss of yours. Otherwise, he'll just keep walking all over you. Aren't there any new employees? Are you still at the bottom of the seniority ladder? It's not that simple, Grandma. You don't know what, bo what Doc is like. Sure I do. We used to go together, after all. She said as we pulled onto Boulder Street, where the hunter lived. He's at that delivery company for as long as I can remember. And he's been pulling this sort of thing for even longer. Let me guess. He's still paying three dollars a delivery, too. I think you're remembering that wrong. It's two dollars per delivery. She looked at me and shook her head with obvious concern. Oh, Jay. I pulled into the hunter's driveway and got out of the car, telling my grandma to wait there. As I approached the front door of the house, I opened it and saw a man in a gray workman's jumpsuit standing there beside a very large cage. He smiled a psychopath's grin, and I saw his pale blue eyes were dancing behind gold-rimmed spectacles. He looked thrilled to have a visitor. Hello, you must be Jay. I've heard a lot about you. Frank says you're the best. Yeah, hi. Nice to meet you. I said, sticking out my hand, feeling strangely annoyed by that compliment for some reason. The cage beside him was black inside, as if it was filled with a cloud of dark smoke. It rattled slightly as I approached. After shaking hands, he told me a few precautions as he helped load the crate into the backseat of the car. I noticed he was wearing very thick gloves like a falconer. These things are smart, don't forget. If you're not paying attention, it'll notice. You gotta watch it like a hawk. I nodded and agreed absentmindedly, not really knowing what the thing was or understanding its dangers. Mostly I just wanted to get this nightmare over with. I figured I'd pass these instructions on to Frank, since they obviously only applied to the creature when it was out of its cage. Little did I know, he was telling me to watch it while it was in the cage. He was giving me instructions for transport. I couldn't help but notice he was glancing at it sideways from the corner of his eye every few seconds as well, as if he didn't trust it. We left the house and started driving again, heading back towards Frank's place. A couple minutes after leaving there, I looked in the rearview mirror to see the cage door was suddenly hanging wide open. What the? I felt a slippered foot smack me in the side of my face, and the car swerved slightly, but I quickly regained control. And then I looked at the seat next to me and did a double take. My grandma was now clamoring over the divide, and her feet were kicking in the air as she struggled to climb over the seat. Grandma, what are you doing? Put your seatbelt back on! Looking over my shoulder, I saw she now had a knife clenched between her teeth and was engaged in a heated battle with some sort of demon squid made of black tendrils like oil mixed with smoke. The cage was knocked over loudly and the sound of grunts and slaps, kicks and punches could be heard. My heart was racing and I was pre preparing to stop the vehicle when suddenly one of the thing's tentacles wrapped around my neck and began to choke me from behind. 
The car swerved across the lanes again, this time nearly crashing into a truck. I managed to correct and veered back into the proper lane as my vision went yellow, then red, then black with pinpoint spots, and I started losing consciousness. Hooked barbs on the tentacle dug into my throat and blood began to drip warmly down my neck and into my shirt. Grandma, help! I rasped in a wheezing, gasping voice. It's killing me. She didn't answer, instead narrowing her eyes and focusing her efforts on wrangling the strange oily squid creature which had escaped from its cage. Every time I looked in the mirror, it revealed a horrifying new tableau. Black, inky spots sprayed occasionally from behind, and the grip on my neck loosened slightly as it redoubled its vice-like efforts. I had never felt so terrified before, not just for me, but for my grandma as well. Strangely, when I looked back in the mirror at her face, she didn't look the least bit concerned. In fact, she appeared to be having a hell of a time, as she wrestled with the uncaged demon squid attacking her. Her foot was in the thing's face as she wrapped its tentacles around her forearm like a spool of loose cable being coiled by an expert technician. Then I looked back to see she was wrapping the long tendril around itself and winding it around the squid like a ball of yarn being rewound. Then she jammed it back into its cage with one hand. Finally, she focused on attacking the stray tentacle which was strangling me and shredding my throat like a block of cheddar on a cheese grater with its oily barbs. Eventually, it released its grip on me and I found I could actually breathe again. I pulled over and slammed on the brakes, and as the car came to a stop, I looked back to see the cage door was closed again and she was dusting off her hands triumphantly. Grandma, what is that thing? How the hell did you do that? Demon squid, Jay. And watch your language. I guess Frank found a loophole for his recipe. It might taste a bit fishy, but it should still do the trick. But... what? How... where did you learn to fight, like, a monster like that? And... I could have used your help out here, like, a bunch of times with those skills. Well, maybe you'll just have to take your old gran out for delivery duty more often. I can probably teach you a thing or two. I used to work for Doc, after all, before we started dating. I felt like there was something she wasn't telling me, but when I asked, she wasn't forthcoming with any more answers. I just have to press her for more details later on. After her lunchtime wine. We got back on the road and started driving again, my grandma now in the back seat, watching the cage very closely. Finally, we arrived at Frank's house again and I got out, going around to the back door, and grabbing the crate. Pulling the cage from the back seat, I carried it to the front door as Franklin stood waiting, tapping his giant foot. You know, Franklin, next time you need a favor, you can ask somebody else. And a bit of warning about the demon squid next time would be great. He snatched the cage from my hands with such force I was nearly thrown from my feet. Nice job, kid. You did good. I have some friends who could use your help, too. I'll tell Doc to send you exclusively from now on when I need special assistance. Groaning, I tried to object, but he quickly stuffed a thick wad of cash in my front shirt pocket and slammed the door, just as I opened my mouth to say, please no, please, 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 for the love of God, no. But it was too late. At least the pile of cash in my pocket felt heavy enough to console me momentarily as I pulled it out and began to count walking back to my car. Maybe it wouldn't be such a terrible day after all, at least financially speaking. Arriving back at the car, I got in. The back seat was covered with black oil and blood that didn't look like it would wash out very easily. And it smelled like a fisherman's wharf during a heat wave. <sharp inhale> the radio crackled the life and I heard Doc's garbled, condescending voice once again. Jay, what the hell are you doing out there? You've been on that call for an hour and a half. I need you in the north end. The Count is calling for his nightly O negative. Head over to Discount Drink Emporium, pronto. All right, my grandma said excitingly as I tried to start the old beast again. I love the Count. 
You'll have to take me with you so I can say hi. After several turns of the key, the engine coughed and sputtered, then it started up and the car began to purr like a laryngitic old house cat once again. Wine time! Hey, Jay the Monster Delivery Man again here. I decided to do a bit of an update since there's been a few changes around here recently. For one, my beloved badass grandma has become my new delivery partner and navigator. She seems to know this town better than anybody, and that includes a few shortcuts and detours that I didn't even know existed, and some that I'd prefer to forget. Also, she managed to convince Doc to pay me an additional dollar per delivery, which she has claimed for her fee, for wine money, of course. So basically I'm back where I started, still making two bucks per call, but at least I've got some company now. And we're saving on home care nursing fees. That new lady wasn't really cutting it anyways, I found her asleep on the couch after Grandma escaped last time with empty cans of Chef Boyardee laying around all over the house. She said she'd fallen asleep after hunting for her for hours, but it looked like to me that the only thing she'd been hunting for was a can opener. The radio blared to life again, and we got our first call of the afternoon. It had been a quiet one so far, and Grandma had her feet up on the dashboard and was taking a little snooze while I played Grand Theft Auto on my Nintendo DS. The old-school overhead version was always my favorite, even though I love the new first-person GTA games as well. I just had to remind myself the game was over when I stopped playing and started driving in real life. Huh. Huh? My grandma woke up with a start halfway through a snore. I let her take the call, since she always enjoyed busting Doc's balls. And she was way better at negotiating with him than I was. Jay, are you there? The staticky voice over the airwaves demanded. Come in, Jay. Muriel here. My grandma said into the receiver, picking it up a second after waking without missing a beat. She was like a cat, I remember thinking to myself, not for the first time. She'd be asleep one second, then stirring up hell the next. <sighs> Muriel, put Jay on, will ya? Nice try, Doc. What's the call? I heard the sound of the company owner sighing into the other end of the radio and took that as an internal victory. Alright, this is a rough one. I'm not going to lie to you. I couldn't believe he was actually leveling with me for once. Or rather, with my grandma. I braced myself to hear what the job would be. You know the deal, Doc. Danger pays for dangerous jobs. Again, I was at a loss. I'd never heard of this stipulation, but it made sense. Still, Doc was never one to abide by common sense. Fine, he grunted back. I could tell it was through gritted teeth. Fifty for the both of you. To split. Each. Deal. I had to catch my breath. Fifty bucks for one call? Each? Go ahead, give me the deets, my grandma said, pulling out a pen and a small notepad from her bra. She handed me the radio receiver so she could write. 32, 22, Fairbank Street. A pair of brothers who run a homebrew operation. I need you to pick up a barrel of something from them. Oh, the Bimbley Brothers. Sure, I know the place. I need to take a barrel of that over to the house in the forest. The subterraneans are doing their annual ceremony tonight. My grandma's hand started to shake slightly. She paused mid-sentence and stopped what she was writing to look at the receiver as if it had just called her a dirty word. I'm sorry, Doc. Did you say the subterraneans? There was no answer for a few long seconds. 
And then Doc spoke again. A hundred each? Two. Deal. She put down her pen and didn't write anything else. You owe me one, Doc. And my grandson. You would have tried to get him to do this for a couple of bucks, huh? You really are an asshole. The radio remained silent for a few more long seconds, and I have expected him to fire both of us, but what he did next surprised me far more than anything else he could have said. Sorry. What was that, Doc? She asked, picking up the receiver and gripping it tightly in her fist. Sorry, he grumbled. All right, Doc. I'll take that, since I know you're not very good with apologies. But you better keep in mind who's riding shotgun from here on now, okay? We'll call you when it's done. With that, the radio went silent, and I stared at my grandma with wide eyes full of amazement. Grandma, how the hell did you just do that? She just smiled and laughed. You gotta know your worth in this world, Jay. Remember, not everybody can do this job. You have a driver's license, a working vehicle, not to mention you know how to get around to Hollow's End. You'd be surprised how much he actually values your services. This was a total revelation to me. But hey, I just take it as a life lesson. Alright. What exactly did we get ourselves into, Grandma? You looked more scared than I'd ever seen when I heard where we were going. I'll explain on the way. Come on. We don't want to keep the subterraneans waiting. Just that name was enough to send shivers down my spine, but I tried not to think about it too much. The idea of being underground or in a cave terrified me. I'd always had claustrophobia for as long as I could remember. Something in my memory banks always stirred uncomfortably at the mere mention of such things as being buried alive or exploring underground caverns. But I can never quite put my finger on what that traumatic memory from my past was. Like, it was just on the tip of my tongue, but never quite attainable. I could only picture darkness and the wet, underground smell of a cave, and it filled me with dread. I resolved to ask my grandma about it later, since she seemed to know a little bit about everything. If something horrible had happened to me underground as a kid, she would probably remember. I started up the old car, and it began to rattle, groan, and rumble to life. Pulling out of the parking spot, I began to drive quickly to our destination on Fairbanks Street. It wasn't far, but I had no idea where the house and the forest would be, or how we would get there to deliver a shipment. Maybe my grandma had an idea, though. You know this town has a lot of history, right, Jay? Sure. I mean, I guess so. And you know that our town isn't like other towns. You understand that, right? It annoyed me that she was speaking to me in this way as if I was a kid or something. I mean, yeah, I wasn't the sharpest person in the drawer, but I understood that our town was different. Then again, I'd never stepped outside of it, so I didn't really know for sure how different. Of course. I watch movies and TV shows, Grandma. And I've talked to people who moved here from other places. I know this town is different. And I know that some of the people who live here aren't exactly normal. Frank, for example. There aren't many places that could attest to having an eight-foot-tall furry blue monster for a citizen. Then there's the Count, the sisters, and of course Mr. Butcher. Not to mention all the others some of whom I'm sure I haven't met since everybody's so damn secretive around here all the time, but I've never even heard of the Subterraneans. Who are they? We pulled onto Fairbanks Street, and my grandma pointed towards a house up ahead on the right. You haven't heard about them for one reason. We don't talk about the Subterraneans unless we have to. It's a bad omen. You have to speak of the people who live underground and take children in the night. I'll tell you more after we grab the barrel. 
We pulled into a perfectly paved driveway on Fairbank Street. The house it belonged to was likewise immaculate, surrounded by stone fences and cobblestone walkways, perfectly tended gardens, and a fine arched gate, high and covered with embellishments which led to the backyard. A pair of men, who looked almost identical, came outside. They were both approximately four feet tall and had long, white beards with no mustaches. Tall hats with floppy ends like elongated toques sat atop their heads, and their clothes were colorful pastels of greens, yellows, and reds. You must be Jay. The barrel is down in the cellar. Come on this way. See if it meets the specifications. Then we'll bring it on up for you. Quickly, they were off, leading us around the side of the house through the gate, opening up a screen door, then a wooden one behind it. They led us down a set of stairs, then down another set into a stone-lined cellar. The air was surprisingly dry but cool, and it was very dark down there. One of the brothers lit up a kerosene lamp, holding it up in his hand, and the room full of huge wooden barrels came into focus in the flickering light. One barrel stood in the center, set away from all the rest. There was a skull and crossbones, painted on it in red. You know, there's not many folks who would do business with the subterraneans, my grandma said with a hint of condemnation in her voice. The two brothers looked at each other for a moment, passing a secretive glance between them. We do what we have to do to get by these days, said Pickle. Times are tough. You know that as well as anyone, Muriel. On the bright side, I see you're out of retirement. Nice to have you back. Just temporarily. I'm teaching my grandson Jay here the ropes. That's good, put in Pickle. The last thing we need is another delivery guy getting turned into worm food. Uh, what was that? I asked, but they ignored me and started bringing the barrel up the stairs. I ran ahead and opened the door for them as the two strong, squat gentlemen lifted the giant keg with ease. They put it in the back of the car and it sat upright, a good three feet higher than the clearance I needed to close the trunk. Uh, do we need some ropes or something to tie it down? I asked, eyeing the giant keg nervously. It's not going anywhere, Pickle said, dusting off his hands. Mm, trust me on that. My grandma and I got back into the car quickly and I followed her lead. She seemed to be in a tremendous hurry. I'd always noticed she was really fast and never seemed to stop moving except to sleep. Maybe it had been from her time working as a delivery driver that she had obtained that habit. All right, she said as I started the old car. You know the forest over by the old cemetery? Off Elm Drive? Yeah, for sure. I used to play in that forest when I was a kid. I replied, driving in that direction. She looked slightly nervous when I said that and was suspiciously quiet for a while afterwards. So, what's the deal with the subterraneans, anyways? Reluctantly, she started talking again. Well, they live in the underground, for one thing. And they've been doing that since time out of mind. The tunnels down there, from what I've seen and heard, are carved with hieroglyphics like the ancient Egyptians used to make. It's somewhat of a mystery how long exactly that secret society has been operating for. It was ominous and quiet in the car for a few seconds, and I turned on the radio to a rock station. Highway to Hell played in the background as I thought about whether my life was worth $200 minus gas and expenses. And what about that whole worm food remark? What did that mean? Oh, that. Well, the subterraneans, they worship these giant, uh, super-intelligent millipedes that live underground beneath them in the forest. There's one in particular that they call the Many-Legged God. It's all very mysterious. 
for all we know, the millipedes made the tunnels, not the people. Finally, we arrived at the forest, and my grandma instructed me to hop the curb and drive across the grass to the edge of the forest. Despite the time of day, it looked dark past the tree line, and almost pitch black the further in we planned to go. Okay, listen, sweetie. See those two trees? The ones with the bark missing from their branches? You just drive between them. It sounded bizarre, as if she was telling me to drive straight into a dead end. But I did what she told me. As soon as we were through, she pointed left. And I was surprised to see two more trees with branches missing bark up ahead, leading the way through the dense forest. Going between them, she pointed sharply to the right, and I found that way was clear as well. Despite how it looked from the road, there was a path leading through the trees and into the heart of the forest. You just needed a guide to show it to you. We veered through the trees for a good 20 minutes until we finally arrived at a dilapidated old house. Despite the dense forest, someone had built a dwelling here, and a substantial one at that. It looked like an ordinary house you would see at the side of any city street, aside from the fact that it was a bit weathered and in need of maintenance. The roof, in particular, was sagging in at the center. Get as close as you can. We don't want to have to carry this thing, my grandma said, pointing away through some shrubbery that allowed us to get right up next to a garage door. Now what? I asked, turning off the car. Now we wait. It wasn't long, though, before someone greeted us. The garage door rose up and a pair of men in vermilion hooded robes were standing just inside, looking at us silently. We got out of the car and stood looking back at them. I waited to see what my grandma would do, but even she looked nervous all of a sudden, and that made me feel downright terrified. Still, I managed to say something, feeling awkward in the lingering silence. Uh, did one of you guys order a, a barrel of something from the Bimbley brothers? They nodded in unison, both at the same time. No words. Instead, they lifted their arms, inviting us into the garage. It was dark in there, empty and filled with spider webs. Uh, it's right back here. Y you guys can grab it, I said, leading them to the trunk, or trying to. But they just stood there, unmoving, their hands tucked into their robes on each opposing arm. My grandma started walking back to the trunk. Come on, Jay, we're going to have to do this ourselves. Trust me, we don't want to take our time out here. We need to be in and out. She looked at her watch again, and I wondered why she was so concerned with time all of a sudden. And then I remembered her comment about being in the forest after sunset. It got dark early these days in mid-December. We didn't have a lot of time, despite the fact that it was an early afternoon delivery. The trees made it difficult to see the position of the sun, but I guessed it would get dark quickly in these woods. Surprisingly, despite her age, my grandma was pretty damn strong. I helped her lift the keg with a tremendous effort, and we walked it slowly into the garage, taking several long rests along the way to flex our aching fingers. I felt bad for my grandma, but she looked more worried about me. We set it down just inside the door, finally getting it to its destination, then turned around and got ready to get the hell out of there. The two men in robes were just behind us, when we turned around and I jumped backwards in surprise. Nan held firm, though, just looking up at them fearlessly. That'll be 400 for the delivery, plus Doc's fee makes an even 600. I'm assuming you already arranged payment with the brothers, since they didn't ask us for anything. Both of them stood there, silently in their dark hooded robes, staring at us. One looked at the other and nodded. He produced a thick wad of bills and handed it over to her with a gnarled, flame-scarred hand. My grandma took the cash, her own hand trembling ever so slightly as she did so, and we slipped past them as they turned in unison to watch us go. 
Without them ever having spoken a word, the deal was done, and we got back in the car. The two men stood in the garage and hit the button for the automatic door to close. As it did, I saw the entire floor of the garage drop out, like an elevator. They descended out of sight with the barrel just as the door closed completely. Whoa, that is some creepy-ass secret society shit right there. My grandma's hands were shaking in the seat next to me and she was looking at me with fear in her eyes. We need to go. Right now. Okay, okay, no problem. I'll just turn around and... I looked to see there was now a large tree blocking the path we had taken to get in. A group of people had clearly dragged it over there while we were busy moving the barrel, since upon inspection it was too large to be moved by just the two of us. I should have trusted my instincts. Got cocky. Got sloppy. Stupid, Muriel. Stupid. My grandma was saying to herself, slapping her cheeks like a fighter about to get ready for a brawl. It's okay, Grandma. We'll just walk back. We'll bring a chainsaw tomorrow or something. Look, no big deal. I know we can't ask them for help, that's for sure. Looking around, I saw there were more of the vermilion-robed figures standing all around us in the woods, hiding here and there and everywhere, watching us. Well, we can't stay here, that's for sure, Nan said, looking at her watch. I think you're right, Jason. Let's get a move on. We'll come back for the car in the morning with backup. The important thing is getting out of this forest before sunset. We didn't have much daylight left, so we took off on foot, the hooded subterraneans watching us silently from all around. Will they hurt us? Not directly, but they can definitely stall us and try to keep us out here. And what happens after that? She shook her head as if to say, you don't want to know. I couldn't help but think of the brother's worm food remark. It was going to be a long walk back to town. Despite our best efforts, we would not be able to make it back before dark. I knew that even then. We walked past the crowd of hooded figures in robes, stepping over the tree they'd used to block our way out. Their hooded visages were bathed in shadow, and their gazes followed after us. They began to make a collective noise amongst themselves, which sounded like the chittering of a bug. And then suddenly I heard the sound of something moving beneath the ground. Nearby, just below my feet, the leaves rustled and stirred as something with mandibles, and a large, black, insectile face began to emerge. And behind it, one hideous row of legs after another. More of the creatures began to emerge from nearby also, and I heard myself scream as my grandma took my hand and pulled me away, heading in the direction of the forest entrance, far off in the distance. The two of us picked up our pace and began to run. After dropping off our most lucrative delivery yet, Grandma and I were on the run. The Subterraneans, a secret society which lived below ground in the forest of Hollow's End, had ordered a barrel of something which I guessed was some sort of highly toxic party drink. We had delivered on time, but the people in vermilion-colored robes had blocked our exit from the dangerous forest anyways, moving a massive tree into the road and preventing our escape. Our attempts at reasoning and negotiation had been met with blank stares from the hooded figures as they were now keeping pace with us, following us, as we attempted to flee the woods with our lives intact. We were bolting through the trees and trying to escape the woods before sunset. Although I wasn't entirely clear on what would happen if we remained after that, my grandma had said I really didn't want to find out. I assumed it had something to do with the army of giant millipedes, who were likewise chasing us through the woods. My feet were racing over the uneven ground, and my stomach was stitching with a cramp as my legs began to tire from running. 
The people in vermilion-colored robes were keeping pace with us, only lagging behind occasionally. This made no sense to me whatsoever, since they appeared to be walking, and we were running as fast as we could. But it just went to show how well they knew the forest. Far better than we did. While we were using the markings of the zigzagging entrance driveway to find the exit, they knew which direction to go by instinct. I looked ahead to see my grandma was moving cat-like through the brush with surprising ease, whereas I was stumbling and tripping over roots and branches, falling to the ground occasionally and finding my face in the rotting leaves and mud. Behind you! She yelled after I fell over one root, landing hard again on the forest floor. I looked back and saw a giant millipede, its head the size of a dinner plate, its body a huge trailing mass far off behind it. The others I had seen were only a fraction of the size of this one, and I realized they were getting larger, as if the bigger ones slept further beneath the ground and emerged in greater and greater size and quantity the closer it got to sunset. Scrambling to my feet, my heart pounding in my chest, I kicked it as hard as I could, as the giant creature lunged at me, quick as a cobra strike. One of its mandibles crunched and cracked with the impact of my boot, and the creature recoiled, making pained, insectile chattering noises. At first I took that as a victory, but then it continued. The loud noises grew louder and added an agonizing screech to the mix, which rose higher and higher in volume. I began backing away, as I saw it was making a cry for more to come as backup. The ground nearby bulged and heaved, rising in various places, tracing lines in the dirt where the huge creature's bodies burrowed quickly in our direction, like mutant, evil bugs bunnies. I ran as they raced towards me, and the one I had injured recovered its wits and dove beneath the ground again with malicious intent. Hurry! My grandma yelled, her cell phone in her hand held up to her ear. She had a knife in the other gripped tightly in her fist. We need backup, Macy! She was yelling into the phone. Get the others to meet us in the forest. We're not going to make it out before sunset. They're coming after us. We need your help. She hung up her call as I caught up with her and we continued to race through the woods, the burrowing creatures chasing after us not far behind, and gaining fast. I'm not going to make it, I yelled, the dirt cracking just behind me, causing me to stumble. Go on without me. She turned around, the sound of me saying that, and shook her head, and then the ground opened up beneath both of our feet, suddenly, as if a trap door had been released beneath us. We fell a ways down and landed in a pit of mud and leaves. At least it was soft enough to cushion our fall so we didn't break any bones. But I found the sticky mud was tenacious and difficult to move around in. I looked up to the ceiling above us to see that the forest floor was now open, revealing the canopy above dark with waning afternoon light. We'd been corralled in like cattle, only to be dropped down into a pit built for our demise. Those bastards. They couldn't find victims for their annual ceremony, so they decided to get some poor delivery people instead, my grandma was saying. It's a good thing I started coming along with you on your route, Jay, otherwise you'd be in real trouble here. Despite her confident words, I couldn't help but see the concern and fear etched in the worry lines of her face. She was putting on a brave act but I could tell that even she was terrified. What the hell are we going to do, Grandma? I asked, trying to find a way out of the mud. I felt like a sitting duck. Taking her by the hand, I tried to lead her up to a dry spot. And that was when I saw them. All around us. The subterraneans were barely visible in the low light of the pit, but I could see their movements and their eyes watching us. They were drinking from wooden cups, probably whatever we had delivered them in that barrel and they were watching us closely and with quiet reverence. What exactly is this annual 
tradition? I asked as we pulled ourselves up onto the slightly higher and drier ground. What's the ceremony that they needed so much wine for? Oh, well, from what I understand, they try to find a couple people, preferably from out of town, but obviously they're not picky, and they give them up as a blood sacrifice to the many-legged god. The one they worship who lives way beneath the ground. My understanding is that it only comes up once a year to feed, and then goes back down and hibernates, since it's quite geriatric and can't stay up very long. Kind of like I, how I need to get to bed by 7.30 most nights. I looked around in horror, hearing the rising sounds of the subterraneans all around us. They were making horrifying, high-pitched bug noises, amplified as if into ASMR microphones. Over there, one made sickening noises like a fly cleaning its wings. Another was like a cockroach climbing up a person's neck. Over here, one sounded similar to a bed bug burrowing into someone's skin. And another made the sound of a mosquito buzzing in your ear while you try to sleep. All of these noises rose up in an echoing cacophony beneath the surface of the forest floor. And I saw dirt and earth come tumbling down from above as the ground began to shake and rumble with something massive moving beneath it. Grandma, are we going to die down here? She looked at me, her eyes brimming with tears. I'm not going to lie to you, Jay. That was all she'd say on the matter. And a second later, the ground burst open a little ways away from us, and the biggest creature I'd ever seen began to emerge. The thing was like a dinosaur. Like a prehistoric creature that had no right existing in the sane and rational world of today. Dominated by people in suits driving Tesla cars and going home to their house cats at night. No, this thing which emerged from the mud belonged in the Jurassic Age. Its mandibles were the size of hockey sticks, its head as big as a car. It came up from the ground, and behind it were row after row of horrible, hairy legs. The creature glistened black, slick and shiny despite its months below ground. For what seemed like forever, it climbed up from below the dirt coiling sickly around and around, longer and longer, a millipede the length of several city buses. The pit below the ground was huge, and now I understood why. Spectators from the subterraneans muttered and spoke in whispered tones, but for the most part stayed silent in reverence and awe of the enormous creature. O oh, ye of many legs, we thank you for returning to us. For granting us the divinity of your presence. A woman's voice began to call out in the echoing chamber. We bring you offerings of young and old this day to celebrate your magnificence. Oh, right. Like, we weren't just what they could find on short notice. Man, these subterraneans are so full of shit, even when they're talking to their deities. I looked over and saw my grandma was looking more pissed off by the second, and I could tell she wasn't going to go down without a fight. Nan, don't do anything stupid, okay? We've got backup coming, don't forget. We can still get out of here. She looked at me for a second and then nodded as if clearing her thoughts. Let's fend it off for as long as we can, Jay. Here, take this. She reached down and grabbed something from beneath us. At first I thought we were stepping on old branches and twigs from trees up above. But when she handed me this sharp-tipped, broken femur bone, I realized we had been walking on the dead bodies of people who had been here before us. Eh, but hey, at least I had a weapon now. And I had a bone to pick with this giant millipede. Although it was large and fearsome, the beast was slow and lumbering as it crawled toward us on its multitude of legs. Did I ever tell you that you're a very special young man, Jason? My grandma asked suddenly, surprising me by using my full name. She hardly ever did that. Only when I was in trouble. Or if she was telling me something really heartfelt and important. Thanks, Grandma. You're a really special lady. 
But come on, don't give up. Please, come on, we can do this. We just have to fend it off until someone can come save us. She shook her head. No, Jay, you don't understand. You were born in this town. And that makes you special. Just like me. Just like Frank and the Butcher, the sisters, and all the others. I'm not giving up. I'm trying to show you what you're capable of. What are you talking about? How are you like Frank? He's a monster. And the sisters are a coven of witches. The huge millipede was almost upon us now. There's no time. Do you trust me, Jay? I nodded. Then toss me! She jumped up into the air in front of me and I did something instinctively and reflexively without even thinking about it. I cupped my hands in front of my body and lifted her boot into the air and her with it, sending her flying into the air like Gimli. Grandma went soaring through the air with her knife in her fist, sailing over the giant millipede's snapping jaws as it tried to catch her but missed. Amazingly, she landed on the thing's back and she used her knife as a climbing axe, scaling down the side of the massive, shiny thorax and then going beneath it like a mechanic working on a muffler. I didn't have time to worry about that, though, as it was on me a second later. Its face came straight towards me, its huge, plentiful teeth looking razor sharp as it opened its huge maw wide and lunged at me. Reaching up with my razor-sharp femur-bone spear, I stabbed at the creature's gums, just as it was about to snap its jaws shut on my head. It screeched and recoiled in pain, but only for an instant. Black, beady eyes full of hate and rage looked down at me as it came in for another strike. But then it stopped suddenly and looked down at its abdomen as if confused. The giant millipede made a pained, guttural sound, and I heard the wet noise of a knife slicing through something closer and closer, and behind that another sound like soggy meat being dropped heavily onto a cutting board. From all around us came the murmuring sounds of confusion from the subterraneans who had been watching this unfold. Those quickly turned to cries of outrage and anger as they realized what was happening at the same time I did. My grandma came running from underneath the giant creature's belly, grinning from ear to ear like a little kid. She had her knife held up high in her hand like an Olympian carrying the torch, and she was slicing the massive millipede's guts down the center of its abdomen like a seam while she ran. Behind her, its organs drooped and fell out, steaming slightly in the cold air. The thing's face became a mask of horrified pain and misery as it began to crumple to the ground. And with a loud crash, the ancient creature which served as the secret society's god suddenly fell to the cavern floor, dead. Nan was covered in black-looking blood from head to toe but didn't seem bothered in the slightest as she wiped off her blade on her pant leg and smiled happily at me. Holy shit. How in the ever-loving fuck did you just do that, Grandma? Her smile suddenly vanished. Watch your language, Jay. Come on, let's get out of here. I was about to ask her how we were supposed to do that when a rope suddenly appeared in front of my face and another one in front of hers. We grabbed hold of them an instant later and were pulled up to safety, just as the robed people came running at us, throwing their wooden cups in our direction, and screaming at us, howling in rage. Once we were safely out of the hole, we clambered into the van of another delivery driver, my grandma's old friend Macy, who had rescued us along with a few other members of Doc's delivery crew, although the owner himself was conspicuously absent. I couldn't help but wonder if he knew how much danger we were putting ourselves in by going out there. And if he had known the subterranean's ulterior motives. I can't believe you actually risk going out there again. Macy said to my grandma once we were safely out of the forest. She was driving fast toward the heart of town, looking back distrustfully at the rearview mirror occasionally. Especially after what happened to your grandson. She stopped talking suddenly and looked directly at me in the mirror. 
Then she looked at my grandma riding shotgun. Does he know? I heard her whisper. Do I know what? They both turned around to look at me and my grandma shook her head. I'll explain it all to you when we get home, Jason. I just hope you can forgive me for not telling you sooner. I couldn't argue with that and didn't have the strength to try. Hey, on the bright side, no car means no more deliveries for the rest of the day. And we made some decent cash back there. Two fifty each, and a hundred for Doc. I couldn't help but smile. She'd managed to weasel an extra hundred bucks out of the deal somehow. <laughs> you kick ass, Grandma. I know. Hey everybody, Jay the Monster Delivery Man here. Things have been getting pretty hairy in Hollow's End lately, especially after what happened last time. My grandma and I were tasked with delivering a barrel of high-proof alcohol to the woods where an ancient secret society called the Subterraneans operate. They live deep below ground and worship giant millipedes, in case you aren't familiar with them. The bastards tried to kill us after we made our delivery, attempting to offer us up as a sacrifice to the largest and oldest of their giant millipede overlords, the cargo train-sized one they call the Many-Legged God. Luckily for us, my grandma had some very good friends who came in and provided backup, and we managed to escape the forest with our lives intact. Unfortunately, my grandma also gutted their giant millipede deity during our escape, and now the subterraneans are really pissed off. Like, even more than usual. Not only that, but my boss, Doc, is also pretty upset because, despite their penchant for human sacrifice, the subterraneans always pay tidy sums of cash on time for deliveries and tip handsomely, so he loves their business. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised to find out he was working with them in more ways than one. Shh! The radio crack of the life suddenly. Come in, Jay. My grandma was off that day, saying she needed a break after our run-in with the subterraneans. She told me she'd retired for a reason and she was going to spend the day relaxing at the casino with her friends, playing high-stakes no-limit Texas Hold'em and drinking Caesars. But I had her number in case of emergency. Yeah, I'm here, Doc. I said, feeling a bit nervous doing deliveries on my own again. What's up? I need to run to the lagoon. There's a package to deliver. You'll get payment at the second location. Okay, I said. Who's the customer? Quit asking stupid questions, Jay. He barked back at me. You know we allow customers to remain nameless, as long as they pay the extra fee. Fine, Doc, that's all you had to say. One anonymous delivery coming up. It's not that guy with no face, is it? He doesn't tip, and every time I do a job for him, I lose track of time and wake up the next morning with a bad headache and missing teeth. There was no response. Better not be. I put the receiver down and began to drive to the pickup spot. The lagoon was just outside of town. The south side of it was a swamp that people usually avoided, since it had a tendency to swallow cars whole with the passengers still inside. And for other reasons, too. Unfortunately, they placed the gravel parking lot right next to it on a steep slope that made you feel like you were a piece of carrot standing on a cutting board, being tipped into a bubbling stew when you parked there. When I pulled into the little slanted parking lot adjacent to the lagoon, I didn't see anyone. No other cars or vehicles were parked in the lot. Safety signs had been erected everywhere telling visitors to remain in their vehicles at all times. I ignored them since they were intended for tourists, and got out of my car, wobbling on my feet trying to maintain my balance on the oddly inclined surface of the parking lot. As I waited for the customer to arrive, I stood leaning up against my car, mostly for something to hang on to, and intermittently braved pacing back and forth, kicking the larger gravel stones in the parking lot and watching them tumble into the water. I kept wondering where the client was 
and when they were finally going to show up. Then, just as I was about to leave, I heard a noise. Psst. The sound was coming from the trees near the lagoon, and I looked over in that direction. A shadowy figure was standing in the little copse of trees, looking out at me. Psst. The voice was more insistent this time. I walked over toward the figure. Hello? Who's there? I called out, but they just stood silently watching me, waiting for me to come closer. Are you the one who called for a delivery? The eyes stared at me from the darkness of the trees, unblinking, and I realized they were slightly reflective. Like a cat's eyes. Or like the eyes of an acolyte from a secret society that has lived underground for millennia, adapting to the darkness through a long-standing process of natural selection. I opened my mouth to scream, realizing it was a trap, but it was too late. Spinning around, I saw I was surrounded by five other acolytes who had been slowly sneaking up on me while the one in the trees drew my attention. Yeah, they were stealthy sons of bitches, that was for sure. They grabbed hold of me roughly, and the one in the trees came out to look at me more closely. I saw she was a tall woman with a big hood covering most of her face. And she pulled it back to reveal an ancient visage. Her face was so pale and gray it looked as if she had never seen the sun. And maybe she hadn't. Her flesh was almost translucent. You killed our oldest ancestor. The one we worshipped and gave thanks to. Ones like her made the tunnels which we call our home, back in the ancient days of lore. She was the last of the titans, yet you and your grandmother murdered her like a simple garden pest. She hissed out her words at me like a venomous snake, and I didn't know quite what to say. The robed figures surrounding me looked intimidating in their vermilion robes, and I wondered what they were going to do to me. I wouldn't have to wait long to find out. Uh, sorry about that, but you you were trying to kill us. It was self-defense. Where is your grandmother, Jay? Tell us. We'll let you go. Somehow I doubted that. No, I don't think so. I'm not going to do that. Look, she may be a wild card who almost gets me killed... But she also saves my life more often than not to make up for it. Not to mention her baking skills and overall awesomeness. I'm not telling you assholes shit. Very well. Interrupted the tall, robed woman, cutting me off and looking disappointed. We will find her, either way. Your boss will see to that. He can be bought off far more cheaply than I would have expected. It's almost as if he wants you and your grandmother dead, Jay. Now have fun at the bottom of the lagoon. She flicked her hand dismissively as if tossing away a cigarette butt, and the acolytes quickly produced chains, which they wrapped around my ankles, attached to cinder block weights. They carried me over to the swamp as I screamed, and they tossed me in. Foul, green, brackish water went up my nose and into my eyes as I plummeted downwards. One quick thing about me. I'm utterly terrified of drowning. I know. Who isn't, right? But I have a good reason to be terrified. Once, as a kid, I was swimming at the local community pool. We decided to play this dumb game where you stand on each other's shoulders to make a tower in the deep end. I was somehow chosen as the one who stood on the bottom, which meant I went under first and stayed down there the longest. By the time everybody else got into their positions, standing on each other's shoulders above me, I was completely out of breath and panicking for air. I was also suddenly pinned under the weight of three other kids standing on top of me, horsing around and not caring about my situation down below. The world started turning yellow, then red, then black with pinpoint spots as I thrashed and pinched and slapped the legs of the kid above me. I almost lost consciousness before they moved. Suffice to say I survived, but I have had a very healthy respect for the prospect of drowning ever since. 
Anyways, with that thought in mind, let's get back to the swamp. The water was so murky and green, I couldn't see the bottom as I plunged down into the depths, and the weights attached to my ankles dragged me rapidly to the bottom. My throat seized up with fear, and my terrorized mind raced with the horrible gravity of the situation. Reaching down, I tried to pull the chains from my feet, but found they were wrapped tightly around them, the steel-bound loop strong and unyielding. I hit the bottom quickly and looked up to see the light was not far above. At least the water was shallow at this end of the lagoon, but it was also where certain other things lived. The tenacious mud beneath me sucked my feet deeper and deeper by the second, like quicksand. I tried to wriggle and squirm out of it, but it only drew me down deeper, until I was very soon up to my waist, then moments later, my neck. Terrified, I tried desperately to think of some way out. Anything that might save me. I remained completely still, afraid that the slightest movement would cause me to sink even deeper into the muck. I remained stationary and didn't go any deeper, but it was obvious I was definitely going to die down there. Resigned to my demise, my heart beating faster than I'd ever thought possible, I began to breathe in, unable to hold my breath any longer. To my surprise, instead of water filling my lungs and dying in the most agonizing way possible, it felt as if I were breathing air. What the hell? You're a very special boy, Jay. I remembered my grandma telling me. You were born in this town. That makes you special. Just like me. I breathed in again and wondered what other latent abilities I might have neglected to notice. Hey, who is that? A loud, booming voice came from all around me. Jay! I gurgled back in response. Oh. Jay. Hey, it's Swampy. Listen. Can you stop breathing me? That feels weird. Get out, okay? I don't like it. Oh, sorry, Swampy. My bad. It's just... Somebody wrapped these chains with cinder blocks around my ankles, so I can't get out of you. Why would they do that? I think they were trying to kill me. Why? I'm not sure. Listen, I don't like this any more than you do. Can you just help me out of here? I'll hook you up with free deliveries for a week. You don't say. I do, just... Don't tell anybody you helped me. I want them to think I'm dead. Why, Jay? The less you know, the better. Plausible deniability. Denial is in Egypt, Jay. But all right. Very funny, Swampy. Come on, help me out of here. The thing called Swampy began to lift me towards the surface, and it spat me out onto the shore like chewed up gum. Black. You don't taste anything like a car. Come back when you taste like a car, Jay. Or if I call for a delivery. You said free deliveries for life now. I said for a week. A vine crept out of the lagoon and wrapped suddenly around my leg like a python. It tripped me to the ground and I face planted in the dirt. The vine began to drag me in towards the algae-coated surface of the swamp once again. Okay, for life, for life! It released its grip on me and let me go. Yeesh! I went to the copse of trees and inspected the area, curious what I'd find. Unsurprisingly, there was a big tunnel going down to the ground at such an angle that a group of acolytes and their rope leader could traverse it. Fucking subterranean assholes. They were going for my grandma next. I was sure of it. And I couldn't trust Doc anymore, which meant she was in more danger than she realized. He wouldn't expect me to be alive, though. Which meant I had the upper hand. Opening up my car door, I looked at the radio and the receiver, with a giant antenna stuck to the roof. Suddenly I didn't want those things in my car. I didn't want Doc tracking me, I didn't want him calling me. 
And I sure as hell didn't want to do deliveries anymore for that sleazy asshole after he just tried to get me killed. I took the antenna off the roof, grabbed the whole setup from inside the car, and tossed them into the swamp. They landed in the algae with a goopy splash, and then disappeared. There you go, Swampy. A little snack. I'll bring you back a full meal later. I just gotta go get the bastard first. The car started up on the first turn of the key, and I gave it some gas, gunning it out of the steeply inclined parking lot. I peeled out of the gravel lot, kicking up stones and dirt, and made my way to the casino. I needed to warn Grandma. Hopefully, it wasn't already too late. Have you ever irrationally worried that a family member might be dead? It doesn't help when they don't pick up the phone. And no matter how fast you drive to see if they're alright, you get nothing but red lights the whole way across town. That was the predicament I was in as I raced towards the casino in my shitbox car to check on my grandmother. There was nothing but gridlock and constant stop and go as I white-knuckled the steering wheel and gripped my teeth in anxious desperation. A bunch of assholes from the secret society known as the Subterraneans had just tried to kill me again, and had thrown me in the swamp with cinder blocks chained to my ankles, mere minutes before. I was still soaking wet from the experience and grateful to the creature who had saved my life. The Subterraneans had told me they were going to see my grandma next, to put the hurt on her. Not only that, but our boss at the delivery company had apparently given us up to them, and by the sounds of it, for about the price of a personal pan pizza. That's how much we were worth to him, how much he thought of our lives. It made me wonder why he hated us so much and what other secrets my grandma knew that he wasn't telling me. Muriel seemed to know a lot more about Doc and the history of our town than I did, and I could tell... He didn't like that she'd been working with me lately. Come on, come on. I urged my crappy car as I fought it up a steep hill, the RPMs heading dangerously into the red. Smoke was beginning to billow from under the hood, but I didn't care. The casino was just around the corner. I pulled into the lot and skidded to a stop in front of the entrance ignoring the cries of protest from the security guards who told me that the sidewalk was not a parking spot. They also yelled something about the dress code not including kelp. My shoes left wet spots on the carpet as I made my way through the foyer. Luckily, the woman checking IDs at the turnstile appeared to be around 90 years old, and her Coke bottle bottom glasses made me fairly confident she wouldn't turn me away from my appearance. She didn't let me down and waved me straight through. Several passerby gave me odd looks as I squished and squashed my way through the foyer in my waterlogged shoes. I ran up the escalator and found my grandma at the No Limit Texas Hold'em table, just where I had expected. She had a very large stack of chips in front of her and was chewing a toothpick menacingly. Also, for some reason, she was wearing a leather jacket and an eye patch. When I sat down, she did a double take. Jay, what are you doing here? She whispered. These people think I'm a fucking war criminal. They can't know I'm a grandmother. Do you see how much money I'm making over here? The gangsters across the table began speaking rapidly back and forth in what sounded like maybe Korean. Then they raised a substantial amount of chips. My grandma sighed and tossed her cards in. Uh, you see that? You threw off my whole strategy. I told him I was related to Kim. I can see that. Now, wait, jong Il? Never mind. We might need to run, like, right now. And why would that be? She asked, raising an eyebrow. Well, it turns out the Doc might have given us up to the subterraneans. They just tried to drown me in the swamp. Not that you've asked why I'm so wet. I'm just glad you're all right, Jay, sweetie. How is Swampy, by the way? 
He's getting free deliveries for life now after saving me, so he's great. Now can we please, please run away? She started playing another hand, ignoring me. I saw her lift up the cards, revealing a 2-7 offsuit. Not good cards. The worst, in fact. Grandma, we have to go. She raised a substantial amount, and the gangsters at the other end of the table raised her back even more. She went all in. They folded. A massive stack of chips was pushed in her direction by the dealer. Do you know what the subterraneans are most afraid of, Jay? Looking around, I saw more than a few roped figures getting to their feet from various tables and slot machines where they had been sitting. Uh, not really. Shit, Grandma, we gotta go. They're here. I was so scared that I didn't even let her finish her thought. I realized later on. But she just calmly replied. All right, let me cash out at least. She rapidly stacked her chips up and put them into a tray, which a casino employee brought over without being asked. Sorry you're leaving so soon, Muriel. Please come back anytime, she said to my grandma politely. Thanks. Listen, is there a back exit out of this place? Of course, just that way. She pointed us over to a kitchen area, and my grandma nodded discreetly. Then she handed the woman a black chip. After a moment's hesitation, she handed her ten more. The woman looked shocked, and I took a quick glance to see they were labeled as $50 chips. I'll give you a stack twice that big if you can stall those robed assholes, she said. Tell them they have to remove their hoods in the casino for security reasons. Deal. With that, we hurried over to the dealer, and my grandma cashed out her stack in record time. I looked over her shoulder to see several security guards hassling the group of men about their attire. We have a deal with the owner. We don't have to show our faces. It's part of our whole thing. We live underground. We worship giant millipedes. The Subterraneans. You must have heard of us. Are you new around here? Their voices faded in the distance as we ran. I looked back to see the North Korean gangsters were also getting up from the table, preparing to chase after us, but then their leader dissuaded them, shaking his head. I could tell by their faces they were not happy with my grandma, though. That distraction won't last long. As soon as they notice we're gone, they'll be after us. My grandma yelled, running a step ahead of me. Come on, I've got a plan. We got out of the parking lot and found my car was surrounded by the figures in robes. They were milling about in a large group, waiting for us. Perfect, my grandma said, smiling. We've got them right where we want them. Really? Because it kind of seems like we're screwed right now. She pulled out her cell phone and punched in a number. Then she spoke rapidly to the person on the other end. I realized a moment later it was Doc. You've got ten minutes to get to the casino, asshole. She spit into the phone angrily. If you're not here by then, this whole town is going to hear your secret. I'll see to that myself. I heard him mutter something in agreement on the other end of the line, then he hung up. She immediately dialed another number as we kept our eyes on the car surrounded by hooded subterraneans. They hadn't spotted us yet, but it was only a matter of time. Gladys, she said when someone picked up. It's time for a change of ownership. Yep, just like we talked about. Get the crew together. The casino parking lot. Yep, just like we planned. Good. See you soon. Thanks. With all of her calls made, Muriel took a deep breath and grabbed my shoulder. Okay, it's time. This is gonna seem a little nutty at first, but just go with it, okay? Trust me. I know what I'm doing. You could say I'm a bit cat-like when it comes to these sort of things. I always land on my feet. And since you're my grandson, you got those same instincts and just as many extra lives. She pulled two vermilion-colored robes from her oversized purse and handed me one of them. I already killed two of them earlier today.
It's a good thing blood matches their color scheme. Now put that on, quickly, Jay, quickly. Holy shit, I said quietly, putting the robe on while she did the same. Then she began to hurry away, heading straight towards the group of subterraneans. Dressed just like them now. Running after her, I tried to catch up, but wasn't quite able to. By the time I got to her, she was already in the midst of them. She acted like an old friend, putting her arms around two of the hooded men and laughing, pretending to be deep in conversation with them. It took at least a minute for them to realize what was happening, she was so persuasive, and by that time the North Korean gangsters were approaching us with guns drawn. Whoa, easy my guys, my grandma said, pulling down her hood and raising her hands in the air. I followed suit. Give us the money, said one of the gangsters in a white suit with a red tie. He was slim and tall, looking like he could probably kick some serious ass. Oh, I would, but I already gave it to my friend here, Muriel said, stepping away from the subterraneans and pointing at one of them whose pocket was now overflowing with cash. She had done a quick reverse pickpocket on the man, I realized, stuffing his pocket with the North Korean's cash. The subterraneans looked at each other and then looked at the money. If there's one thing those guys love more than secrecy and living underground wearing robes, it's money. They shook their heads in unison, wordlessly refusing. Then they pulled knives from their robes and began to move towards the North Korean gangsters. And that's our cue to run, my grandma said, and I followed after her as she bolted from the scene. A gunfight and quite a massive bloodbath ensued as the subterraneans outnumbered the North Koreans, but were outgunned. They made the classic mistake of bringing a bunch of knives to a gunfight, but still managed to kill quite a few gangsters. My grandma and I ran as fast as we could from the parking lot and found ourselves face to face with Doc, just outside the perimeter of the place. He looked over our shoulders in awe, his jaw dropping further and further down with each passing second. Dozens of cars pulled up one by one over the following minutes, each one with a big antenna on top of their vehicles. Each one a delivery driver for Doc, the worst boss in the history of Hollow's End, or anywhere else. All of us watched as the fight wore on in the parking lot, the only remaining subterraneans eventually retreating and escaping down a nearby tunnel. The North Korean gangsters had somehow been wiped out by them, due to their numbers and their uncanny ability with weapons. But quite a few had been killed. A dozen or so bodies were lying unmoving in the parking lot, blood pooling around them. Sirens could be heard approaching from the distance. I'm very glad you're all here, Muriel said once it was clear the fight was over. She stood on top of a nearby car where all the delivery drivers could see her and hear her. Doc was standing below her looking scared and trying desperately to slink away. Several large men and women were blocking his path, though, stopping his getaway. Thank you for coming. You've all seen how Doc has treated us poorly in the past. That's part of the reason why I left this company, and all of you who I love so much. I came back recently out of retirement to help my grandson Jay who I saw was being taken advantage of, in much the same way I had seen Doc take advantage of all of you. There were murmurs of agreement from the crowd, and Doc's face began to turn a shade redder. Well, I'm afraid it's gotten a lot worse than simply paying low wages and making us take dangerous jobs. Doc has been actively trying to kill us off trying to bring in new workers who he can take advantage of by murdering us. Not only that, but he's done this before. Shouts of outrage and anger rang out and Doc began to protest, but he was suddenly shouted into silence. I couldn't help but wonder who and what she meant by that. And then I suddenly remembered that my parents had been delivery drivers for Doc as well. 
before they had mysteriously died in Hit and Run. Could that have been him as well? He tried to have me killed earlier today, I said loudly, and just now he did the same thing to Muriel. We barely got away. I was at home the whole time, Doc yelled. I didn't do anything. Bullshit. You didn't have to leave your house. You never do. You sent me to die at the swamp. Set me up to get killed by the subterraneans. They told me themselves. And they said you'd give them Muriel's location next, and here they are. Big coincidence, wouldn't you say? I've heard enough, yelled one of the other delivery drivers, and the rest of the crew shouted their agreement. He's been taking advantage of us for years. We don't need him. I said we all quit his bullshit company and let Muriel take over. Who's with me? The shouting didn't stop until the police arrived, at which time we happily handed Doc over into their custody. He was charged with conspiracy to commit murder, and ended up convicted of two counts, after several people from around town corroborated our story. Some time has passed now, since all that happened. These days, my grandma and I are running our own semi-successful delivery company. The only one of its kind in Hollow's End. And the residents of this town are more than a little grateful for our services. Especially the ones who can't go out in the daylight. Even monsters need groceries after all. Among other things. All the drivers are making decent money nowadays. And we refuse service to anybody who pays with empties or tries to have us killed. Subterraneans being at the very top of that list. Frank is still trying to get away with his usual shenanigans, and occasionally we have to deny him service for trying to abduct or eat delivery crew members. The Bimbley brothers are still brewing mysterious substances in their basement, and the whole town is happy to know that the subterraneans have been put in their place again, and will hopefully stay away from town for a while. However, my grandmother isn't so sure. She doesn't trust that any of us are safe. When they get hit the hardest, that's when they're the most dangerous, Jay. She told me the other night. Years ago, we did the same thing. We thought we'd gotten rid of them completely. But it turned out they were just hiding. Biding their time. And waiting. I've been having trouble sleeping since hearing that. There's a sound outside my window every now and then like movement in the shrubbery. And I've been hearing those sounds more and more lately. Every once in a while I think I see someone looking at me through my bedroom window. A dark, vaguely human shape in a hood watching me people in the darkness, observing me, waiting for their time to take me, just like they've done before. The scrape of a knife blade on glass squeals loudly, as if in agreement, and I look and see them again, and know that I'm not imagining things. They're just outside my window. They're watching me. They're waiting to take me back to the place beneath the forest. This time for good. All right, that does it for uh, the monster delivery man. If you enjoyed tonight's story, which hopefully you did because you made it to the end uh, and you want to support the channel the best thing you can do right now is to share this video with somebody else subscribe, like, comment if you haven't done that already uh, huge appreciation for listening I'd like to do more videos like this on the channel that are uh, longer length and more immersive so it does a huge, huge help to me if you can share this with somebody else 
Thanks again for watching tonight's video, for listening. Please join me again next time, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.